Okay, good morning, everybody. <coughs> it's really lovely to be here and to be part of this really excellent session. Thank you to, to Brooke and to Alex for those really excellent presentations. So um, I'm a medical sociologist by background. I did all of my training in sociology departments, um, up to and including my PhD. But post PhD, I've worked in much more applied healthcare settings. And I think now I, I think of myself more as a health services researcher, but whose work is informed by social science theory and social science methods. Um, and I will also say that a lot of the work that I do um, as part of my group at the University of Leicester in the UK is around healthcare improvement research. Um, so thinking about quality and safety in healthcare and how we can improve the quality of healthcare that's delivered. And that kind of influences the, the way that I think about some of these issues that we're talking about in this conference. So um, there are, on the slide, there's some ways in which you can contact me if you would wish to, and you are very welcome to. I don't particularly have any conflicts of interest, but I think I would just want to say a couple of things just to kind of help you get that sense of the, the perspective that I'm coming from. So I'm an academic researcher. As I said, I'm not a clinician um, of any kind. I have grant funding from various sources to do various things. I think it's interesting what Alex is saying about um, funding, because often I end up doing work around overdiagnosis sort of on the sly with funding that's actually to do other things. Um, and that's something that um, we can maybe talk about later. I am a member of the UK National Screening Committee, where I bring kind of social science and implementation science expertise. Um, and I'm an, an associate editor at BMJ Quality and Safety. And if you've got fantastic work around interventions to tackle overdiagnosis and overtreatment and you want to submit them to BMJ Quality and Safety, please do. We really like to have some of those kinds of papers. So I don't need to tell this audience that we are probably doing too much. Um, we are wasting resources that sometimes are very scarce, doing things that don't necessarily bring benefit. Um, we are harming people in various ways. Um, and there are lots of interventions, and we've heard lots of them um, in this conference and in previous conferences, trying to, to bring about change in this space, to try and do less, to intervene less, to diagnose less, to treat less. So there's an awful lot going on in this space. Um, and the perspective that I kind of started to come to this from was to think about, from the perspective of kind of health systems and healthcare organisations, what is it about the way in which those um, organisations organise and deliver and structure and manage healthcare that we need to think about in terms of thinking through how can we deliver kind of just enough medicine? And I was really fortunate to get a personal fellowship from um, an organization in the UK called the Health Foundation, which allowed me some, some thinking time to sort of think about this. And I really wanted to focus on that organizational or system level perspective. And I like to show this picture of um, a bowl of porridge when thinking about kind of just enough medicine, because I think it makes two points quite nicely. One is that um, that balance between not too much healthcare, not too little healthcare, and getting that balance right can actually be sometimes really, really difficult. So getting porridge, if you think about Goldilocks and the Three Bears, porridge that's not too hot, not too cold, not too thin, not too thick, that balance can be quite difficult. But I think the other point that it makes is that that balance will probably look different for different people. So Goldilocks did not care at all for Daddy Bear's porridge. She didn't like at all Mummy Bear's porridge, but Baby Bear's porridge was much more where she could be happy. So the idea about what just enough looks like and feels like can probably look quite different in different contexts. So I quite like that analogy. And when I started coming to this conference, I was really struck by how a lot of the focus is on individual behavior change. I went to lots of presentations around shared decision making, around decision aids, around encouraging people to try and recognize their own biases in their decision making. And, you know, that's great and I don't have a problem with that. But I'm interested in thinking about how individuals think and understand and behave within the context of those broader social systems and social structures and some of which is around cons consciously made decisions, but some of which isn't, and some of which is kind of behaviours and ways of thinking that are shaped in ways that perhaps individuals are not necessarily particularly aware of. And I'm not for a moment suggesting that there isn't any of that work going on at this conference. You know, we've just heard about some of it so, so far this morning, and I've been to several sessions um, just in this conference thinking about mapping those wider drivers of overdiagnosis and overtreatment. This is a paper that's quite um, a few years old now, and probably lots of you will have read it, but it was kind of one of those early attempts to really map some of these more complex drivers. 
Um, and within the paper, there's this really nice diagram which shows, A, the kind of complexity and the different layers of, of things that can be influencing overdiagnosis and overtreatment. And down the left-hand side are lots of possible drivers in lots of different categories. And on the right-hand side, possible solutions um, to those. So I I'm not suggesting that this, this isn't being thought about in this conference. I think it very much is. So that gets me to think about, okay, well, if we're, if we're sort of in that space of wanting to think about how we can encourage people to think differently, behave differently, do differently, ap approach things differently, it reminds me of um, this paper, which lots of you will probably have read, it's a few years old now, by um, Trish Greenhouse and colleagues, which was really talking about that work that needs to happen to translate evidence-based medicine into practice, to kind of navigate that translation, to, to, to bridge that gap, to um, tackle that gulf between population-based evidence and what it actually might mean for the individual um, in front of you. And they have argued in the paper that really what they would want to see and what they think we should be working towards is population-based evidence that healthcare professionals and patients can then take and translate into that particular context and that they can use as one part of a broader set of resources and sources of knowledge to think about um, what is going to be the right thing to do in any particular circumstance. And this made me think back to my early training in medical sociology, particularly around um, the role of the professions and certainly the kind of profession of medicine. So on the left-hand side there is a book by Elliot Friedson, who's a very well-known sociologist writing about the professions. And he um, thought about uh, med the medical profession as operating in what he characterised as a zone of discretion. So within sociological analysis of the professions in general and the medical profession in particular, there's long been this attention to the exercise of autonomy and discretion over how work is done and what good looks like in that work as a key element of characterising the work of the professions. Um, and that, I think, you know, kind of made me think about, well, is that what we're talking about here? Is that the kind of zone of discretion that you can take different forms of evidence and different forms of knowledge and you can use them in a way that best suits the situation in front of you? But we know that that's not always so, so straightforward. And on the right-hand side um, is a book by Michael Power, which I also really like, um, called The Audit Society. And in that book, he's really talking about how, you know, over recent years, society has developed much more this idea that, you know, the forms of knowledge that we prioritise are formal, encoded, official forms of knowledge, um, and that we prioritise those much more strongly than we do kind of more tacit, informal forms of knowledge that come through things like intuition and experience and what's often talked about as kind of having a feel for the game. And I think it's interesting to reflect on those different forms of knowledge and whether and how they might be useful um, in the kind of work that we talk about in this conference. I also have used um, in some of my quality improvement work the kind of political science literature around blame. And I think it's really interesting if we're thinking about um, you know, the ideas of defensive practice, which we hear talked about quite a lot in this conference, what we can, what we can kind of take from this kind of literature. So Christopher Hood is somebody whose work I've used um, in my work, and he talks about blame as the, the act of attributing something bad or wrong to some person or entity, that it involves some actual or perceived harm or loss, and I think that difference between actual and perceived can be quite important, as well as really crucially that attribution of agency, very much the, uh, the idea that something bad has happened and you had some ability to control that and to prevent it from happening. And I think, you know, if we think about it in those terms and if we accept some of kind of Christopher Hood's writing, then it's, it's easy to start to understand how organisations within contemporary societies can become very focused on blame avoidance and actually sometimes have quite large scale apparatuses um, that are designed to try and help them deflect um, and to protect themselves from any accusation of blame. And it's not particularly surprising then to think about how that impacts on the work of, of individual professionals within those organisations. Another literature that I really like um, is the literature around institutional logics. So this is a literature that's been around for um, perhaps even three decades now. And it's really the idea that, that large-scale organisational social structures tend to be characterised by some quite distinctive sets of assumptions, values, beliefs, practices and ways of understanding that offer kind of acceptable repertoires to people acting within them that constrain the choices that they can make, 
the choices that they can actually see as being possible, the ways in which they behave and the ways in which they can understand things. Um, and I think it's very much this idea that it's a set of material practices and symbolic systems, including, as I said, assumptions, values, beliefs, through which individuals and organisations give meaning to their daily activities that are important in organising the time and the space, organising how work gets done, um, and that then becomes reproduced by people enacting and embodying those experiences. So this is an example um, of how we can use some of these ideas to think about the social organisation of healthcare work. And this is work that was also funded by the Health Foundation through a doctoral studentship that Caroline Cupitt held. And Caroline will be known to lots of you. She's presented her work at this conference before and, sh and she's here um, this time as well. And this work was focusing particularly on cardiovascular risk scoring within the context of the NHS Health Check in the UK. And the work showed how healthcare professionals used knowledge of evidence-based risk reduction to frame patients' queries about taking preventative medication as barriers that needed to be overcome. And that was really interesting. And what Caroline did through her work was to really interrogate the kind of textual processes and the ways in which healthcare professionals' work was shaped um, and undertaken to really understand how that was happening. And what was really important was that, that you know, we weren't pointing the finger at individual practitioners who perhaps you know, might not have been educated enough or weren't sufficiently committed to shared decision making, but really trying to understand how their work is being shaped in certain ways and how they feel that they really don't have any option but to engage in that kind of activity. And we use these ideas to look at some other kinds of examples within our work. I'm not going to talk about any of these in huge details, but if you want to chat to me about them later, you're very welcome to. So um, one of my PhD students, Fawn Harrod Hyde, has recently finished some really interesting work looking at trying to understand decision making around apparently inappropriate transfers from um, care homes to hospital and thinking about, well, for residents who, um, you know, there might be some deterioration in their health, there might be some concern, why do they end up being transferred to hospital, even though nobody really thinks it's going to have any great benefit, and there's lots of concerns about what that might do and the negative potential consequences for that individual. Why do we still seem to be having these transfers happening? I've got another student, um, Frank Quatri, who was hoping to come to this conference, but unfortunately hasn't been able to. And she's been exploring defensive practice in maternity care. So really trying to think, you know, tr trying to kind of get behind that idea of defensive practice to really try and understand what is it that people are scared of? What is it that they're worried about? And she's doing some quite interesting work kind of comparing that with the case law in the UK. I've got another student who's looking at person-centred medication reviews for older people in care homes and particularly the role of pharmacists within that. So thinking about you know, how particular kinds of professionals are positioned within this space, the kinds of roles that they're being asked to do, how that work is socially organised and how they interact with other kinds of health professionals in doing that work. Um, and another student of mine who's just started um, and is here at her first Preventing Overdiagnosis conference, Claire, is going to be doing some work looking at how within general practice in the UK people can account for and explain not doing, how they can kind of be more on the front foot perhaps in terms of saying, I considered doing this, I've decided not to for these reasons, and how they can do that in a way that makes healthcare professionals feel more safe in having done that. So... In terms of thinking sociologically about not doing, I kind of went round and round this for quite a while because as a sociologist, one of the things that you're really interested in is how people end up doing things that they don't really want to and didn't really mean to, but somehow through the ways in which their kind of behaviour is, is shaped and informed and, and some of the choices and not choices are available to them, they end up in, in situations where you think, hmm, I'm not, I'm not really sure how that happened. So thinking sociologically about not doing is something that I'm quite interested in. And I wrote this paper a little while ago in a sociology journal. Um, and within that paper, I used this work by uh, Susie Scott, who is a UK-based sociologist, who wrote a really lovely paper called A Sociology of Nothing, Understanding the Unmarked. And this is one of those papers where you read it and you, it's like a little light bulb goes off and you think, oh, yeah, OK, this is, this is really helpful. Um, and I think f in terms of what Scott does in this paper, so she talks about in social life, nothing is not just a passively endured condition, but a reflexively managed mode of experience. Choosing not to do something 
whether that be you know choosing not to have an intervention have a you know piece of medical care to disengage from a group or, or just to find nothing relevant in a dominant cultural script can all be considered demonstrations of agency but i really really like the last sentence here where she says nothing must be accomplished or done whether or not we are aware of doing it. And this idea that you have to accomplish the doing of nothing, the, the doing of, of, of deciding not to, I found really interesting. And in the paper, um, Scott has this distinction, um, which isn't novel um, particularly, but she sort of makes that decision, distinction between acts of commission and acts of omission. So acts of omission being about when we choose to avoid doing or being something through that conscious disengagement or disidentification. On the contrary, acts of omission occur when we perhaps more passively neglect or fail to act, ending up in another position by default rather than by conscious intention. And one of the examples Scott uses when she talks about acts of commission is the refusal of medical treatment. But I think we could, of course, extend that to think about declining to have preventative interventions, declining to either have or to offer um, investigatory tests or procedures that might, in theory, be available. And I also think acts of omission are also really interesting here. Um, so lots of the work that I've done has been in the context of population-based screening. And I'm really interested in people who do not engage with screening, whether that be through a conscious decision not to that they're happy to talk about, or whether that's just a more passive, I am not engaging. And I've had lots of discussions with some of my colleagues on the um, National Screening Committee in the UK about, you know, how long do you consider people fair game and try to keep encouraging them to attend if, you know, up to that point they have apparently chosen not to do so? And how do you strike that balance between wanting to make care accessible and make sure that people are aware of those opportunities with at some level recognising and respecting that as to this point they have not yet done that? So they are some interesting discussions we have. But I think in terms of accounting for not doing, so this is still from Scott's paper, she talks about the act of making a deliberate choice to reject a potential line of action that might have been normatively expected. So as we've already heard this morning, perhaps laden with all sorts of assumptions about what's right, what's appropriate, what's sensible, what's responsible, but still deciding not to do those things and therefore potentially making oneself socially conspicuous. And Scott says, when demonstrably doing nothing, the actor considers but rejects a normatively expected action for its negative associational meanings. And they may need to skillfully manage reactions to this as deviants in everyday life. And I thought this was really interesting, thinking about how if you have healthcare professionals, if you have patients who want to do less, why can it seem much harder to do less than to do more? What is it that's going on there? So I really liked how Scott's writing kind of helped to, to sharpen some of those things for me. So if we think about doing less within complex systems, if I kind of put my um, quality improvement hat back on, if we think about kind of quality measurement that focuses on important processes and outcomes, including you know, clinical care outcomes, patient experience outcomes, this is really often seen as an essential feature of well-functioning healthcare systems. And I don't really have too much of a problem with that. But what I think is interesting to try and think about then is what might we need to do to reorient healthcare organisations and healthcare systems to, be tr to try to be better able to support clinicians and their patients who want to do less rather than doing more, who want to think about the person in front of them, what might be in their best interest, what fits with their preferences and values, and think about how can people feel um, safer and more confident about choosing not to do things. So one of the things I did during my fellowship was to write this paper for BMJ Quality and Safety, which was thinking about overdiagnosis and overtreatment as a, qu as a problem of healthcare quality, which isn't a, a desperately revelatory thing to think. But one of the things that I tried to do through this paper was to think about um, what have we learned from the healthcare improvement research literature that can be applied to this space. And I think there are three things that I drew out. One was the need for really, really clear articulation of the problem that we're trying to solve. And really importantly, that that problem articulation recognises the problem in context. So what is it about the broader context, whether that be the, the healthcare organisation context or something else, what is it about that problem in its context? And from there, you ideally want to have a really strongly theory-informed intervention. 
that's not necessarily a golden bullet that that will absolutely always work but it's much more likely that you'll be successful if you've got that really clear theory informed intervention and a really clear kind of logic model or a theory of change i will do x to bring about change y so that it has beneficial impact z and that that's set out really clearly and really credibly and of course robust evaluation including qualitative process evaluation to really understand whether and how interventions have been successful or not. And I think this is really important because I, 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 I feel that we, we could be doing more to think about for people who do want to try and do less but are perhaps not so confident about it. How can we try and identify ways and develop ways to for them to feel more comfortable to do that so that they don't feel that they're never navigating this minefield where they might be called to account for their problematic behaviour at any moment. How can we do things that make them feel more secure and safer about doing that in practice? Um, I will just end by saying that a lot of the thinking that I've just talked about we have written up um, as a book chapter for um, a wider series about quality improvement in healthcare. If you are interested in reading more, please do have a look. I've made a QR code. I can't tell you how proud I am of having done that because I'm not very technologically literate. If it doesn't work, don't tell me. Just Google it and pretend it's all been fine. Um, that would be very, very much appreciated. Um, there's a few of the references there for things that I have talked about. And when you get the slides circulated, obviously, you can pick up on those if you would wish to. But uh, thank you very much for listening. And I will stop there.